I will uh, read our opening words. The power of we was the theme of this year's General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist, Universalist Association of Congregations. These are the words the General Assembly used to frame discussions of the theme. What does it mean to embody the power of we? As a gathered assembly, we will tell stories of experiencing our collective power, identify our theological and spiritual roots, and name the core of our faith that unites us. Connect with Unitarian Universalists across generations through heart-to-heart -heart conversations about spirituality and imagination. And these questions. When is a time that you felt the power of we in Unitarian Universalism? What is so important in Unitarian Universalism that you would be willing to sacrifice for it? What will it take for Unitarian Universalism to fully empower the power of we? Taking a little different approach here. Um, Peggy and I were both at uh, General Assembly and many of us, many of the others who are even here tonight, today, sometime, right now, uh, were there as well. Um, we spent some time uh, talking about it and uh, our discussion was so fruitful that I didn't want to uh, take all the words on myself. And so I'll be uh, either passing the microphone or she'll be reaching out for it from time to time in dialogue, yes. So. I, uh, myself, have spent the last few weeks embedded in our wider faith, and uh, you're actually getting a twofer. Um, a few days after General Assembly, I went off to uh, Camp and Sid Sen up on the uh, eastern shore of uh, Lake Coeur d'Alene, where the Pacific Northwest District had their first ever high school summer camp, where I was part of the leadership team, to my great joy. Um, and uh, the things I experienced in both places uh, have led me to many thoughts about the ongoing evolution in our faith. So the big take homes for me in all of that, I was thinking about the core of our covenant and I mean the core of our faith and I believe I've come to the belief at this moment that the core is the very idea of covenant. I'll talk more. I think the mission of our faith is to find the balance between the universal and the particular, a way of being a greater we which affirms us at every level of our identity and beliefs. There are things which have and always will make this tradition, Unitarian Universalism, what it is. At the same time, we will inevitably evolve as our knowledge and our understanding evolve. If we fully commit ourselves to a covenantal faith, which preaches the inherent worth and dignity of every person, then we are committing ourselves to a faith that will and must change with every person who enters or leaves. And finally, the we does not end at the edge of our faith. This is both our spiritual home and our test lab, where we can bravely discover by lear learning and doing what we need to do in the greater world. Now, I spent most of my time at General Assembly, at the worships, in the youth spaces, connecting with my people, especially the people who entered seminary somewhere or other around the same time that I did, and I had the most fun with the people who dropped out like I did. Um, <laughs> and, um, well, where, what spaces did you spend time in? I, I went to a number of um, different sessions. They have all different kinds of sessions. Um, some were wonderful. Some were kind of like, you know, you go to a session at a conference, and it. Uh, I, I feel like the faith could do a little better with its presentation, like ixnay on the hour point. How would you say PowerPoint in Pig Latin? Anyway, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Forget about those. They do not work. They don't work in UU either. But uh, there were some like that. But the other thing I did is I attended, and I and along with some others, um, some of the meetings, some of the, the the business meeting that we went with our cards to serve as delegates and to vote, and um, they were. <laughs> 
um, about the messiest thing that um, that happened there. They well, and there and there were some messy things, but boy, that was. But it 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 was actually um, it actually ended up. Um, being among the most reinforcing things in terms of where our faith is and really that it's a point of faith. Shall I explain? So we have new moderators. We have two new co-moderators and uh, they are younger and inexperienced. And at the same time we have these moderators, we, the, 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 the faith has decided to alter its rules of uh, how it operates. So it's got some Rod Burt's rules of orders, but some not. So it's like a hybrid. And uh, and then there's always people who are UUs who really want to be heard a lot. And <laughs> when you combine that, it was a very, there was a lot of friction and a lot of tension during the first session. Um, because the, the moderators did not have good control. It was their first time, for goodness sake. It reminded me of being like the ninth grade class president who was not pretty. I, literally, I, I, was, I was right back there. I felt just like that woman who was up on the stage because she didn't have control of the audience. There were people looking at her like, why don't you have control? There was also very much a race dynamic and a class dynamic because both of these people were... Uh, she was she was a black woman, and I, 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 can't, I don't think the other person was a person of color. But anyway, they were new. They were new to the faith. They were new voices in the faith. They needed some space and some grace, and there were people in the audience who were not giving it to them. So that was a tense morning. It was really not fun. By the next session, they they had gotten more control and more adept, and they brought in some other people to help them navigate. And most of the people present, um, you know, were better too. So, like I say, that was that was one of those into the fire moments, but really, really one of the best illustrations of what we're trying to do here. And so this doesn't just become a you know a uh, end of the summer you know school report. This is what I did this summer. Um, the the thing that I see in that is, you know, partly an evolution of who, you know, inevitably is in the leadership, um, but a, you know, a gracefulness that is evolving and a learning to lean into the discomfort that is evolving. Um, compared to past general assemblies I've been at, you know, the amount of hours devoted to where every single delegate from every single congregation is expected to be on the floor listening to people first at the the in favor mic and then the opposed mic and then the procedural. the procedural mic which sometimes takes more airtime than either of the other mics um, there's a lot less time there's more time devoted to faith and so I think we're we're evolving our um, we're evolving our priorities um, I was thinking about contrasts with other general assemblies that we've been at. Um, there was, why don't you talk just a sentence or two about the, the Portland in 2007, the first one that you went to. It's hard to remember. The main thing I remember going to Portland in 2007 was JD, because he was my buddy and we actually shared a room and that was the really a huge part of my experience was kind of babysitting JD for, for good or ill. But um, it, was, it was still a wonderful experience. It exposed me to some of the wonderful things about the faith. But I got to tell you, it was um, white and old. Uh, and uh, it felt like a convention that had been going on for years. And there were a lot of people there who had been there for years and years. And it felt like just kind of coming in on that party. So that was kind of my impression of that first one I went to. And then um, the next one, I believe, that you went to and that I also went to, along with um, our oldest child, Carl, was um, in Phoenix in 2012, which we called Justice General Assembly. And that, I think, marked a turning point for our annual gatherings. And it contrasted with what she described in that there was actually pressure to move it to a different locale before it started because of some racist happenings in the city of Phoenix and in uh, like um, Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his um, 
concentration camp for um, uh, undocumented immigrants. And then somebody said, wait a minute, have we talked to the people there who were involved in those struggles about whether they want us to come or not? And they came and we heard from them, yes, by all means come, we have some work we would like to do together. And this was the first time that General Assembly, I believe, had really focused on what's going on right here in this place that we're all coming together to visit. And that was a moving experience for me um, in a logistical miracle. They found buses that was able to transport 3,000 of us from the, from the convention center to the tent city where we all protested and back, and that included people with limited mobility, all the scooters and the wheelchairs, which were then a new thing as well, was paying a lot more attention to mobility. So greater inclusiveness, greater engagement in the community. Um, we had undocumented immigrants standing on stage and saying, this is me and this is who I am. They had we had people challenging us to say, to recognize that the people that we're building, you know, that, that we're trying to keep out of coming across the border until we through war obtained this land from Mexico, there was no border there and they moved back and forth. Very challenging ideas, uncomfortable, but that's where I see us as a faith beginning to lean into them. 2015, again in Portland, uh, the theme then was building a new way. That was a very uncomfortable uh, General Assembly. The Black Lives Matter movement within the UU, the BLUU, Black Lives UU, um, was um, challenging us to to, as a faith, as a whole, to back them up. And that made some people really uncomfortable because some of their talking points were, or not just some of their points of their platform are, brace yourself, the abolishment of the prison system, which a lot of people were really scared by, especially the people who were holding the mic at the original, at the earlier Portland. Um, and the, the assembly nearly came to a standstill over this during the, um, the business sessions. And bless their hearts, the youth of the Pacific Northwest District brokered the agreement that broke the logjam. They went and talked to all the people and got them to come together. And the, mo the motion passed. And then in Spokane, this just last year, the theme was the power of we. And the engagement with the community there was um, through the black and colored people's community there. We. Uh, I don't remember the name of the group though. Yeah. <laughs> well, and shame on us for not really understanding the role of people of color in us, which is like totally isolated. Totally, you know, that's not an easy pr way, place to be a black person. And they, they do exist. They are present. So there was a, an action there because there's something going on in Spokane now that they're talking about building, a new, building new prisons, building another jail. So the, this community group wanted to, we worked with them and did an action uh, like, a, like a protest. Uh, and um, it got press coverage, and that was nice. But the, the woman who's the head of this local group, and I can't remember their name. It's actually named after a fellow who was a, um, uh, or the community center they're building was named after a fellow who was a UU for it's starting in like the 30s. And I, I, we got to get his name. But so they're building a big community center for, people, for African American people and uh, others, uh, people of color. But one of the women involved in that effort stood up in front of a group of UUs. Uh, and others, but mostly you use at this conference. And she said, I have never felt so supported in this community. There, that is a story of isolation. 
the folks in that community, and you know, they're still getting jailed. It's not like it's not like bad things aren't happening to uh, people of color in Spokane just because there aren't that many of them. They are happening. It is happening, and nobody's paying attention, including we weren't paying attention. So, so in a way, this was another phoenix. This was another you you coming to a place and saying we have to understand. We have to understand places. You know, we have to understand where we are and the uh, and the things that happen in those places. So that was that was really meaningful. Another memory that's going to stick with me from this general assembly is uh, the speaker at the Ware lecture, which is a annual lecture at every general assembly. Um, that was funded by a family that goes all the way back to the origins of Unitarianism. And it's had, you know, people like... Thank you. The Carl Maxey Center named after a well-known civil rights activist and Spokane native, will be a hub of the African-American community. Let's support this. Let's figure out how we can support this financially and whatever we have to do. This is our community, you know. And at one of the services, um, they do take, they do take uh, collect, um, donation, they, they pass the plate at the services um, at General Assembly, and one of those was specifically for the center, and the, collectively we donated tens of thousands of dollars um, to support that. Um, the Ware Lecture um, has had such people as Cornel West, as Martin Luther King, um, some of the most important voices for justice in our, um, in our uh, history as a faith since the uh, merger in 1962. And before that, the Unitarian Association. The lecture this year was uh, Richard Blanco, who is a poet, a poet of three countries. He was conceived in Cuba, born in Spain after his mother and his family um, escaped to Spain, and then as a toddler came to this country. And it was wonderful to hear him speak about his feeling, his love of this country, his absolute love, and also his holding up of the paradox of a country that uses the word united, this is my words, the united in its name, and expects on some cultural level assimilation and uniformity, and yet also ought to be celebrating its diversity. And I got in line afterwards, and I got a book, I got his latest book of poetry, and I got it signed, and what did he say to me? Um, and it says, be love and be one always. So, there. Um, and I wanted to share one poem there because I think it speaks well. And if any of you all want to borrow this or I would suggest getting it, it's a beautiful. You donated copy downstairs, beautiful. Declaration of Interdependence. And you will hear echoes of the Declaration of Independence in here. Such has been the patient sufferance. Were a mother's bread, instant potatoes, milk at a checkout line, were her three children pleading for bubblegum and their father, were the three minutes she steals to page through a tabloid, needing to believe even stars' lives are as joyful and bruised. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. We are her second job, serving an executive absorbed in his Wall Street Journal at a sidewalk cafe shadowed by skyscrapers. We are the shadows of the fortune he won and the family he lost. We are his loss and the lost. We are a father in a coal town who can't mine a life anymore because too much and too little has happened for too long. A history of repeated injuries and usurpations. 
Were the grit of his main streets blacked out windows and graffitied truths? Were a street in another town lined with royal palms at home with a Peace Corps cu couple who collect African art? Were their dinner party talk of wines wielded picket signs and burned draft cards? We are what they know. It's time to do more than read the New York Times, buy fair trade coffee and organic corn. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress. Where the farmer who grew the corn, who plows into his couch as worn as his back by the end of the day, where his TV set blurring news having everything and nothing to do with the field dust in his eyes, or his son nested in the ache of his arms. We are his son, or a black teenager who drove too fast or too slow, talked too much or too little, moved too quickly but not quick enough, or the blast of the bullet leaving the gun, or the guilt and grief of the cop who wished he hadn't shot. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We're the dead. We're the living amid the flicker of vigil candlelights. We're in a dim cell with an inmate reading Dostoevsky. We are his crime, his sentence, his amends. We are the mending of ourselves and others. We're a Buddhist serving soup at a shelter alongside a stockbroker. We're each other's shelter and hope. A widow's 50 cents in a collection plate and a golfer's $10,000 pledge for a cure. <laughs> I'm such a softy these days. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We're the cure for hatred caused by despair. We're the good morning of a bus driver who remembers our name, the tattooed man who gives up his seat on the subway. We are every door held open with a smile when we look into each other's eyes the way we behold the moon. We are the moon. We're the promise of one people, one breath, declaring to one another, I see you. I need you. I am you. And another layer, well, I should mention of his identity and his being is that he's also gay and worked very hard with his partner of um, many years to uh, uh, fight for marriage equality. Although they only just now got engaged because neither of them, you know, neither of them had thought to ask the other. Um, had, so, but they're engaged now. But what a joy to be a part of a faith that invites a man with words like that to both bless us and challenge us. <sighs> the final worship I'm thinking of, which was Sunday morning after the official formal close, was a beautiful expression of fr frustration and hope. Um, the the person who gave the sermon was a clergy person, African American, and she spoke of the challenges that she faces as being a part of our faith. The words that echo in my mind were, I've run out of things to say and ways to say them so that people will hear what I'm trying to say. And yet, the theologies of our faith, she said, of redemption, of universal redemption and universal worth, and of unity of all things, are what brought her here and what keep her from leaving, despite the frustrations she's had. And at the end of that, the song that we sang at the beginning, and then we'll sing again, um, every it was a bold statement. Every person of color at the convention was invited up onto the stage. And they kept coming and coming and coming and filling the stage until there was not room anymore. 
and it doesn't represent the proportion of people of color in our country, but it's a lot more than there were <laughs> back in Portland. <sighs> back to my thoughts of the youth spaces. Oh, I also want to hold up the, um, actually the youth, the, um, the bridging ceremony, just like we do bridging here at the General Assembly, the youth bridge every time. And the take home story there from that one was the idea of a brave space. The youth um, in the last few years have said, you know, it's all, not all of us shiny and happy and having had perfect middle class upbringings and graduating and going off to our Ivy League school and being happy and successful in every conventional way. Some of us are coming here with momentous griefs. And in the course of the service, they had two homilies given by youth holding up both sides of that. There's joy and fulfillment and coming of age, and there's grief. Grief for the wounds of youth, some of whom live with mighty big griefs and mighty big wounds. Um, and if you roam and look up on YouTube, the various events that were, have been recorded and posted up there, please watch that one. The idea of a brave space as opposed to the idea of a safe space that kind of gets a little bit of, I don't know, some people don't like the idea. Um, but the youth have reframed, have reframed the idea as a brave space. This is a space that we create together where we can, in security and love, examine our wounds and name our hurts and challenge ourselves to grow. Camp Blue Boat. If this is a picture, if the, if the picture of youth spaces and youth worship is anything like what I see at our youth cons and at our, at our general assemblies and the youth caucus and at our camps, um, if it's a picture of what's going to be coming, then y'all better be prepared for different ways of doing worship and many other things. I've gotten so used to that space that I was uncomfortable here because they always sit in a circle. Always. The chalice is dead center. People who are speaking may walk around the chalice slowly to look at everybody. But what the youth tell me is they do it that way because it makes everybody into a participant and not into an observer or an audience. They tend not to use hymnals too much because what are you, where are you going to put it while you're sitting there? And so they all have these spiritual songs that they sing together and know by heart or teach each other in the course of the service. <laughs> you see what I'm up to there? And um, the theme of that was the, uh, the five jagged stones. We touched on one each day. Lovely... Uh, um, idea that we're a work in progress. Um, and you know, it's only a UU camp where one of the workshops in the afternoon one day was anti-colonialism as a spiritual practice. <laughs> There's more there than you might think. You giggle at first and then you start thinking, oh. Um, we had time set aside for um, uh, gender caucusing. We had people who identify as male over here in one room and people who identify as female over there and people who identify as trans or as non-binary or I don't fit into either of those categories in any clean way. They went off to their own space and talked. And each group we talked about what is it about being with this identity that's hard what is it about this that might give us advantages that we might not necessarily deserve? What have we learned? What can we learn by talking about this and learning from each other 
rather than depending on the people who might be affected by us. And then we regathered and talked about what we had learned. And the people who identify as male had some things to say, and the people who identified as female said that we had had some things to say. And then the other group, the cis, trans, non-binary, I mean the trans and non-binary, they said, that was our space, and it's holy. And we're going to keep that to ourselves. This is a faith that can hold that kind of work. My old brain has some things to get used to. For every session we did, even all the way up to the last day of the week, we would go around, even with people we've been meeting with, the same little group of people all week, our little um, small groups that we have for the duration, introduce, we would do in our check-in, say your name and your pronouns. Do I go by he and she? Do I go, do I go he and him? Do I go by she and her? Do I go by they and them? Nobody had anything else, but I wouldn't have been surprised. Let me tell you, this 54-year-old brain has a lot of work to do to wrap its head around that, to do it without having to think every, every two seconds. But I think that's the kind of work I'm glad this faith challenges me to do. <sighs> Some other things I've thought about in these last three weeks. At the camp and at GA, we talked about the term white supremacy came up again and again and again. It's a thing we're struggling with. And it's awkward and it's uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable to talk to a young man who's been in this district and is now off to college in Washington, DC. He's African American. And it was awkward and uncomfortable to be with him as he shared what 4th of July means to him. He's got no use for it. Our country was founded. People wrung their hands and they said it wasn't a good thing. Some people did, but slavery is written right into our constitution. But growth comes where discomfort is. That's what I'm taking home. I thought it before, I think it even more now. Growth comes by leaning into the discomfort, listening without interrupting when someone speaks their truth that might be really hard for you to hear. I was delighted to see the trailers for the movie about the, the uh, Tulsa church. Did you want there, so the the Tulsa UU All Souls Church is part of a movie that's coming out um, real soon. I, I think it's just starting. It's called American Heretics, and it sounds really great. I think we should try to get it for the Kenworthy. It's going to have a showing in New York City real soon. But if you look it up, it's it's the the people at All Souls Unitarian, and then also the people I think from the UCC church in that area, but really interesting, very high production value too, but real interesting uh, movie. And I think it would be a neat one for us to bring in. So that, that might be a plan. And just a little bit about that church and its history. Um, it's been there for well over a century. Um, big, beautiful, classic Unitarian Protestant edifice. Um, but they've been growing a bit in spiritual and in numerical ways. And there was a um, evangelical um, clergyman in the area uh, who had risen so far in the Baptist circles that he earned the title of Bishop, Bishop Carlton Pearson. And he woke up one day and realized he was a universalist. He didn't, I'm sorry? He didn't believe in hell. Uh, about him? Yeah, there's a movie about him. There's a movie about him, but this is going to be more about him and um, the, the the newer movie. And he and his as he started preaching more and more about the idea of universal salvation, he was stripped of more and more of his power until all of a sudden he wasn't part of a church anymore. But we ain't got no creedal requirements. 
And he walked across the street and a few hundred of the people who believed in what he'd been preaching followed him. And now, fast forward, there are three services every Sunday morning at All Souls in Tulsa. There's the one that's a lot like what we usually do. Down the hall, there's a slightly smaller room where the staunch humanists meet and have their their uh, good old fashioned lecture style, um, you know, science and humanities 101 seminar. And then in the third wing, there is the singing and praising and gospel of universal salvation, 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 no, salvation, <laughs> sorry about universal salvation service led by Bishop Pearson. And they're all living together under one roof and they're all learning from each other. Now, how's that as a vision of what we can be as a faith that has a universal value and a universally open covenant that's willing to be transformed by who it lets in its door by the virtue of the faith that tells them this is what we need to do? All right, I'm, I'm, someone's waving the clock at me, so we need to wrap up here. The big take homes, again. The core of our faith is the very idea of covenant. Our mission is to find the balance between the universal and the particular. We will evolve as each person comes and leaves. And the we does not end at the edge of our faith. This is both our spiritual home and our test lab where we can bravely discover by learning and doing, even in the uncomfortable places, what we need to be doing in the greater world. Amen. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive it is time to lead ourselves into the well it is time now and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall turn to lead in love in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love we are the alone by the company we keep by the ones who circle round to tend these fires we shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within it is time now it is time now that we thrive. It is time to lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning, we shall turn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love.